Good morning. I'm Gary Millspaw here at Brownback Mason and Associates in Allentown, Pennsylvania. It's Tuesday, November 19th, and we're here for the first part of the three-part webinar, Pathways Through the Brain. Tom Brownback, there he is. There's Tom with his QEEG license plate. He'll explain that in a minute. Tom will be <laughs> joining us here in about 10 seconds, and you may be hearing my voice in the background for comic relief and technical support. You all have my cell phone. If you need it, call me at any time. And uh, folks, here's Tom Brownback. Thank you. <clears throat> and I say good morning to all of you. Good morning. <laughs> Still waiting to see your smiling face, Jeff. Is anybody oh. else having trouble hearing? Because it's really low to me. Mm -mm. Uh, me see now you have uh, volume buttons um, I can hear all of you there's Jeff there I am uh, Gary's going to see what he can check on here uh, let me just give you a quick overview um, while Gary's uh, getting these last-minute uh, arrangements made. Beverly and Jeff, you're, you're not showing audio right now, but you're not muted, but I'm not showing your audios up. So take a look at that if you can. And there. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Now Jeff's audio is there. We want to try to get a good audio connection. And Anne, you're saying it was low or Beverly was no, low? I'm good. I did, but it's better now. Okay. And Beverly, are you hearing us? We're seeing you, Beverly, not hearing you. I hope you're hearing us. we got to get your audio on. Um, you need to plug in something, Beverly, or do something so that yeah, we're not he We're seeing your lips move, and we're not hearing your voice. I don't know why. Now I'm showing Beverly's audios up. We'll talk a little bit while you're doing that. You need to turn that off? Uh, yes. <clears throat> turn off the slideshow. There we go. And you want that up or gone? I want this right where it is. All right. Very good. Move this over. All right. <clears throat> Uh, now, let me uh, just, again, go back to the quick overview. And in a sense, it's a quick overview of the beginning of this, which is an overview. Um, uh, my um, uh, goal today, and um, actually over the next three times, is to uh, walk you through uh, four major um, aspects of what we call the Brownback Mason and Associates Neurofeedback System, or Beeman's for short. Um, and we will be looking at uh, an overview of the system uh, to start with, and then we will go to neuroanatomy. I want you to see where all the parts of the brain are that we're going to be discussing. Uh, you'll close that door, please. Yes. Um, and then we will go into the beginning of neurophysiology, and that just means to me the functions of all those parts of the brain uh, that I showed you during the neuroanatomy. Um, and then in, oh, and excuse me, and then we will continue from there once we start with the neurophysiology, and we will go to how information moves through the brain. Uh, this is uh, Gary um, chides me because the names of my manuals are too long for him. Gary has come on in the last year, and he is our promotional person. My head is so busy in doing therapy and creating manuals and other things that I don't have any time to promote. 
So we brought Gary on, and uh, he says, Tom, we have to get these manual names shorter. Uh, there are uh, eight manuals that make up the Beeman system. And uh, this will, uh, for these next three times, we will be going through manual one. Uh, so we looked at how information moves through the brain as a way of making uh, these functions more alive to all of you. I have had a um, number of people who have told me how very helpful this has been to them. And this is never just, um, it, there is never only the purpose of you learning information. It is always the purpose of learning the information so at the end of the day, you can be the best neurotherapy trainers um, that are alive anywhere on the planet. So that is my goal, and um, that makes me happy when uh, people tell me, wow, this helped me uh, so much. It helped me to figure out why I'm training, where I'm training. And um, we have found here that I teach my clients this. We start um, our, when I, I'll tell you a little more about that later, but at the end of the map review, um, clients often will report that uh, they understand what is going on better than they ever have, and then when it comes to training, and one of the, the highs for me, especially for a child, is when the child um, or teenager, based on what I taught them in the map review session, say to me, um, Mr. B, the you had said such and such, and if that is the case, don't you think it might be good for us to do this or that? And I love looking at Johnny, and with that serious look, um, I was in the Marine Corps for four years, and with that kind of hardcore, tough guy look, say to him, Johnny, do you know what that means? And Johnny looks up kind of afraid, and I said, that means you just earned five thousand more points toward whatever it is they're working toward. Um, so I love it when that happens. I want you to experience that and for you to experience that with your clients that uh, based on this understanding of what all these parts of the brain do, you will have a sense of a much better uh, insight into what you are doing. Um, okay, now with that said, Let's jump in here and I'll blow everything up. There we go. And uh, this was my uh, gift from my wife for Christmas one year. Whoops, the uh, slideshow started and I didn't want it to be a slideshow. Either that or this just moved. <clears throat> Um, so, yes, that was my present. Um, is this I, doing slideshow? Okay, you need... I don't think it is. I think it's just shifting. Okay. Okay. Because the slideshow is... Um, All right. Now, here is our, um, just to kind of get you grounded into my world, our 111-year-old Victorian building that we use for our offices, and uh, my wife Linda and I, who is... Um, also a psychologist, though this is where we work and where we live. Now, there's another view of it. Get this back up again, and here we are in the summertime. And here we are in the autumn. Love this red uh, tree right up to the ramp that people go to. And here are some of our staff. A number of you will, if you uh, purchase our manuals or have questions about certain things, this is our office manager, Sarah. And uh, Sarah puts everything that I create into Corel Draw. And then from Corel Draw, it goes into the PowerPoint and into the manual and their manuals, and we're always updating our manuals. 
and there'll be uh, a service we provide called the Comprehensive Neurodiagnostic Checklist, uh, a 300 item checklist that will, uh, that is web based, that will allow you to uh, flesh out uh, 46 different neuropathologies, uh, such as ADD and OCD and GAD and all the Ds. Um, and this is Donna. Uh, she's my administrative assistant, but she is also in charge of the CNC and its companion, the CTC, which stands for uh, the Customized um, Tracking Checklist so that you can watch client progress uh, as they go along. Um, and with all that said, introduce you a little bit to uh, where we are and what we do. Um, let me take you here. So secrets to our 95% plus success rate. And um, people, uh, appropriately so, always say, what does that mean? And for us, uh, when we look at our CTC, the comprehensive, or excuse me, the uh, customized tracking checklist, um, we are looking for a 90, excuse me, a 50% reduction in pathology. And uh, this can be tracked on this tracking uh, checklist. And when we get uh, at least 50% reduction in pathology, we consider that success. And uh, you didn't just click that on me, did you? <laughs> no, no yeah. over here. Different machine. Um, sometimes I find my wireless mouse uh, has my um, what I put up on the screen jump to the next one. Maybe it's trying to move me along, I don't know. <laughs> um, and there are other criteria for this success. Uh, a lot of people uh, do research, and especially people who know nothing about neurofeedback. And um, they have this criteria of, well, if you did the biofeedback of any sort, including neurofeedback, did certain things change without them looking at any other component? And that is very much not our position. Uh, in addition to neurofeedback, we do uh, what we call um, a bio psycho, socio, theological, cognitive, behavioral framework, or the basics for short. And this will be one of the upcoming uh, webinars that I present. And uh, 16 healthy behaviors, four for each of those different headings, four for biological, four for psychological, four for social, and four for spiritual. Um, and if people do, there's no rocket science here. Under the biological, you have uh, nutrition, uh, sleep, exercise, relaxation techniques, um, and so on for all the others. And I have people track their progress, uh, or, or I should say success, for that week on each of those 16 areas. I have them do that for both my psychotherapy clients as well as my neurofeedback clients. And it's my very strong position that if a person is not participating, maybe not perfectly, but at least with some concerted effort in um, living in those ways, then I don't include them in whether they succeed or don't succeed. Um, and I tell them this up front. Um, my wife takes the intake call. She goes over the fullness of our system that people want to come for neurofeedback. Um, and one of those things are these 16 healthy behaviors. If Johnny at 3.30 in the afternoon comes to see me, you know, 15 year old Johnny, and he has had a Twinkie for breakfast uh, and a Coke for lunch, 
um, Johnny's brain is not going to provide you or me with any means of doing neurofeedback. Um, if that's all the nutrition he's had in his brain for the day, uh, then um, this is just not going to be a very feasible method of helping him. And this is, again, explained up front. And um, so that is uh, what we require. That's one of the things. We require other things beyond that. Uh, but those are all part of what we require for success. All right. Now, going through the system, <clears throat> I just mentioned a, a couple parts of uh, what we do. But here, and let me blow this up. So I'm getting more used to using my mouse here. <clears throat> Here's the first uh, of the eight steps, or eight parts. And this will be renamed. Uh, pathways through the brain uh, in a short time, but for right now, and this, these, are, these are the components that are in it. What are the functions <clears throat> and what are the frequencies um, at each of the International 1020 system placements? And um, again, today and next time and the time after, we will be going through um, all of those um, functions and then how the information uh, comes in through the eyes or the ears and moves through each of those uh, aspects of the brain, or not all each of them, but many of those aspects of the brain, those placements of the brain. Moving on. Um, <clears throat> oh, and let me say that for us, it is always from a 1020 system point of view. Uh, I have taken a number of workshops through the years, and people say, well, you train in the front, or you train in the back, or you train on the left or the right, and I come away with that cold feeling of, um, I got seven placements in the front. Uh, I have eight on the left or eight on the right, so when this person who's presenting says to train in the front or the left or the right, that does me very little good. And for us, everything is done very specifically by these 19 1020 system placements. So you will constantly hear me referring back to the 1020 system. Number two, if there is a problem, in any of those placements, from the point of view of too much microvoltage or too little at any frequency or coherence or peak frequency, if there are any problems at any of those placements and you know the job of that placement, for, inter, uh, for, for instance, if we look at the frontal rim, um, If we look at the frontal rim of the brain, FP1, FP2, F7, F8, um, we see those as placements that have to do with a number of functions. One of them is attention. And so if you have too much theta or too much alpha or too much beta or there's some hypercoherence between any of those placements and any other placement, this will negatively affect the functioning of that placement. And if that placement, if the, the uh, neurophysiology under that placement um, has to do with attending in this case, then there is a high probability that Johnny is not going to attend uh, in an optimal way. And so this is what our step two, our manual two, looks at, the 46 different neuropathologies that I've already mentioned. And it looks for the most likely placements for those, patho those neuropathologies to take place and how it may show up from um, a microvoltage peak frequency, asymmetry, or coherence point of view. Moving on. How do we know 
where to look. How do we know what, let me put it this way, what presenting problem the person is coming to our office to have us help them uh, to deal with? <clears throat> and this is our step three. For years we did this by hand. Um, but back about four years ago, uh, a man named uh, Dirk Mulder, uh, who is the president of the largest neurofeedback provider in all of Europe, uh, he's in the Netherlands, and he has, uh, I think it's 10 different locations and 40 different neurotherapists um, that work for him. And he invited Linda and me to come over to Amsterdam to present our four-day workshop on this material that we're going to be talking to you about today. And Dirk said, when you get here, I want to talk to you about something. So when we flew over and <clears throat> he said, your manuals are the greatest thing in the neurofeedback world. Uh, he said, however, would you like me to help you to move into the 21st century? And I said, sure, Dirk, that would be great. Uh, why don't you help me do that? Um, and so um, I said, how are we going to move forward with this? And he said, let me turn your manuals, or at least several of them, into um, web-based services. And um, let me try something here. Turn my mouse upside down. Maybe that will help it not to shift. Um, and uh, so I um, didn't hear from him uh, for a while. I just went on about my business as I got back. But about a year later, he contacted me, and he says, it's ready. So he had taken um, the 300-item checklist that we use, takes about an hour, an hour and a quarter to take, and it will subjectively, based on the client and up to three significant others, um, other raters, uh, it will provide a look at where Johnny's problems are. Um, many times people will call and say, I have ADD, or today Asperger's is popular, or um, a number of other problems. But if you really look at what's going on, you will never find one problem. I've been doing this for 35 years, and that's never been the case. So if you don't know the, the range of the problems, at least the major problems, then you are not in as good a place for doing the neurofeedback. Um, so we will, I will show you uh, this um, as we move along, and um, what you will see are the 1020 system heads. Again, everything we do is 1020 system, um, and uh, in fact, let me, uh, let me jump into that right away with you. Let me just give you a quick view of it. So this is manual three. These are all the questions. And the plan
was to have the 46 different neuropathologies be shown on one page. Uh, that didn't work so well, and so it has become four pages. And I'll just briefly show them to you. Um, and, and, and saying that, let me go back actually a step. The plan was when I decided to create this manual series, and this is back now 10 years ago, uh, maybe a little longer, that I thought I was going to create one manual, maybe 200 pages long, and for every neuropathology, there would be a single placement and a single frequency, and it would be done with either eyes open or closed, um, and that the world was going to be nice and neat and orderly. Um, after um, about five years of trying to make everything fit together, um, that one manual turned into eight manuals, and the 200 pages has now turned into 1,600 pages. Um, and uh, the one placement has often turned into a number of placements, and the one frequency has turned into a number of frequencies. <clears throat> Other than that, it worked out just perfectly the way I had planned it. Um, so that's, uh, that's how life goes. And um, so here for manual three, uh, in a smaller, uh, to, to a smaller degree, it uh, went the same way. I thought it would be one 1020 system head, uh, but uh, it, it didn't go that way. All right. So here we are. I'm going to blow this up. So, for instance, here's executive cognitive dysfunction, um, part of those dysfunctions are ADD, distractibility, and attention. And you can see the purple box, and it comes down here, and it wraps around uh, FP2, FP1, F8, F7, FZ. And so what this says uh, is that the person rating Johnny, there would be a number in here. Um, the, this is, as I said, a web-based service. So when people take this, it's, uh, we get their email address. And then once you have their email address, you type that in. And the email with the 300 items is sent to their home or to wherever it is they want it sent. And once the last person clicks that they're done, uh, a few seconds later, this report shows up in your office. A um, lot more to be said about it, and, and we'll be doing a webinar on this uh, later on. Um, but uh, the short of it is that these numbers will be filled in, and let's suppose there's a 95% here in this part of it um, for ADD distractibility, and what that would say is there's a 95% probability that one of these placements is going to have abnormal readings. Um, now, people say, well, then, Tom, I want you to brain map. And I would say, well, that's not true because this doesn't tell you which frequency it in, it's in. It doesn't tell you if it's a microvoltage issue or a peak per frequency issue or a coherence issue. So there's still much to be done uh, beside this. But this is how we start doing our brain map review. Uh, that we have this in the upper left hand corner. And if I, I'm going to move my head, if you look behind me, you see this big blue board on the wall behind us. And that's where we do our brain map uh, review. I have 70 pages of the brain map pinned up to that wall along with this CNC and uh, some other things. So, um, Moving along, you can see that. Now, here's page two. This shows mostly learning disabilities. See a lot of these in the back of the heads, a few of them in the front. Um, and for listening and reading and uh, nonverbal over on the right and math. So it will flesh them out, show you where the likelihood is to train. This third one has to do with limbic system um, and basal ganglia structures. 
has to do with memory, um, issues like obsessive compulsive disorder, um, amotivational, um, tick right. disorders. Yeah, I'm very sorry and then that. number three, excuse me, page four, uh, for us, generalized anxiety is not a placement, it is a frequency, fast betas, and uh, what we find is when the generalized anxiety gets taken care of, sleep disorders will typically uh, improve. And so we just have this for those uh, several disorders, insomnia, hypersomnia, uh, GAD. This will eventually be used for autistic spectral disorders. Um, we've worked on them for several years to get them as organized as we want them, and um, it has been very complicated because it is not nice and neat. Uh, there are many, many things that make up the ASD um, areas. So that's coming eventually, as are many other things that I uh, keep working on. All right, so that is step three for us. Let me go back here. And then step four for us is an in-depth analysis of the QEEG you know, using the CNC. You, we do psychoeducational testing. Um, and um, to me, doing this analysis and then presenting it to the client is like an art form. And I find that if you do that well, <coughs> excuse me, that... Um, Clients will be very highly motivated to come uh, and do the work. Uh, we have had uh, <coughs> many uh, people who, when they finish the MAP review with us, uh, sometimes mothers will start crying and say, um, we've had Johnny to neurologists and pediatric um, psychiatrists, and no one has ever explained to us before why Johnny struggles the way he does um, until you have just shown us. So a very um, powerful times in doing that, that map review. Um, and again, we will have webinars set up uh, to go through this process as well. <coughs> now, once these four pieces are done, and as I mentioned, we do a four-day workshop on all of this material, of which you are getting in smaller pieces. Um, we do that two times a year out in Cleveland uh, at this point, and uh, for uh, Brain Master of uh, Stress Therapy Solutions, uh, we will be doing it probably, we have done it in other places, and uh, we'll likely do more of it in other places as well. Um, at the end of the first 50% uh, of that workshop, of uh, approximately a 30-hour workshop, um, six questions are answered. And those six questions are come off of these first four steps of our system. And this is how it works. My... Uh, Office manager Sarah, her husband is a conveyor expert, and so uh, I asked her to put this together for me. She did it with conveyor belts. Um, and um, here we are. We go through what we just talked about, the functions and the pathways, the dysfunctions, the neuropathologies, where the problems live, then the CNC, um, 1020, the evaluation sheet I just mentioned, and then the in-depth analysis of the brain map. And that all brings us to this. Number one, what is the neuropathology that you are um, looking at? Number, let me skip here, number three, or I'll call it number two, what 1020 system placements are involved? Uh, number three, what is the problem at that 1020 system placement? 
Is it magnitude? Is it coherence? Is it peak frequency? Uh, if it's a magnitude, what is the bandwidth? Number uh, four, what is the bandwidth of that magnitude? Uh, or coherence, not just magnitude, but there's a bandwidth for any of them. Um, number five, are you training that bandwidth to increase or to decrease? And then number six, is the training most appropriate based on what the brain map is saying when the eyes open condition or the eyes close condition? Um, so those six issues at the end of the day is what, and when we do the, the full workshop, what I just spent close to 20 hours training people to understand how to get. And I submit to each of you uh, that if you want to be the best at helping those who come to you, you need to know the answers to those six questions. Uh, it's not going to just be one neuropathology. As I said already, uh, we look typically at the, the highest rated six neuropathologies. Um, and even with that, when you just take one of them, um, it's not likely going to only be at one placement. For many of them, it's going to be at several placements. Um, and it's not only going to be one frequency. There's often going to be several frequencies. So understanding all of this is what will help you to do the best job uh, for your client. Now, for us, then we go to Beeman's, uh, again, our Brownback Mason and Associates Neurofeedback System, Beeman's Form 254. And let me bring that up. Here is our Form 254. Um, and this has 10 components to it. Uh, four of them are like housekeeping. The other six are the ones I just showed you. Number one. What are the initials? Uh, and we have created our manual five and six for both Brain Master and Thought Technology. And we have these forms for both of those uh, pieces of equipment. And for both of them, they will list their training programs. They're called settings files for Brain Master or channel sets for Thought Technology. Um, and they're all done alphabetically. So we start and we put the client's three initials in. So when we go and look for that client's training programs next time, there they are alphabetically ordered. Number two, age. Uh, we use Z-score training, uh, live Z-score training. Um, that's part of the, what we, uh, how we train. And we need an age for that. Uh, number three, what is the neuropathology? Uh, and again, I've said there's going to be a number, uh, but which one are we training right now? Number four, are the client's eyes open or closed? Uh, this is critical, especially when you're doing uh, live Z-score training. Uh, but whether it's live Z-score or not live Z-score, um, for them to know whether their eyes should be open or closed is very important, especially when you're comparing one session to another. If they had their eyes open in one and closed in another for the same training, that's going to cause a problem. Number five, what placement or placements? We have a, a Form 254 for one placement, two placements, four placements. Um, and we have a whole color coding system, which I won't go into now, but that's why they're red, black, yellow, and brown here. Um, now, this is a slightly older form. We have to get the new one put in. Well, Sarah and I have this little joke that if we're working on something in the afternoon to update any of our manuals, um, and we're saying, oh, wait, this doesn't look right, and they say, oh, that's right, because we just changed it that morning. And so if it's the afternoon, it's already uh, you know outdated for us. Uh, so we uh, laugh our way through that. Anyway. This is what we have for number six now, the Z-score training, live Z-score training. And first is ZSNA, Z-score not applicable. There are people who don't use Z-scores, that's fine. So we have a set of settings files or channel sets that don't use live Z-scores. 
uh, then ZSPT, and that is Z squared passive training, where we'll use microvoltage or coherence or some other metric um, to do the audio and visual feedback, but in the background we watch the, the live Z scores. And then our third option is Z score active training, where the Z scores drive the audio and visual feedback. Then, component number seven, um, are we doing? What kind of training? Is it magnitude? Is it coherence? Uh, is it live Z scores? Number seven, if it's magnitude or coherence, what is the band that we're going to be looking at? Um, number eight, um, what is the width of the band? And from the map is how we get this, and we make this as precise as we can to a, a half a hertz bandwidth. So from six and a half up to twelve and a half. If that's what the brain map says, then that's what we train. Um, are we training it up or down? Another critical issue. If Johnny thinks he's training up, but he's getting feedback for training down, he's not going to have a good training day. So I go over each of these pieces of information with Johnny uh, before he starts training uh, that day. Um, so now, armed with all of this glorious knowledge, and here it is in this form, we then move on. Um, to this. Now the, the back half or the, <clears throat> the, the training half of our system. Manual number five or step number five are all the procedures that we use and how to set them up. I've created uh, about 325 settings files for BrainMaster. Um, and the, the Two of the things, three of the things that you will hear me say, because this is my need, that everything is completely systematized and organized. And because of that high degree of systematization and organization, within 60 seconds, you can go and create one of our settings files um, that will be completely customized to that client. Um, and it will have all of these pieces that I just talked about in it. Step number six, mastering independent training. It is our goal to have our clients be able uh, to set up much of this on their own. Some people will get to the point where they can actually do the training without me. Um, now that's probably only about 25% that get to that place. But all of the people coming, we have a cap for everyone who trains. Uh, the same kind of, it's similar, not quite the same as the brain map cap. Um, so they put their own cap on, they get their ears ready from an impedance point of view, they get their placements ready, they come to another room, which is the room we're in right now, they turn on the equipment, they go and get their folder in the equipment, they hook up their sensors, um, to the equipment, and before I walk in the room, um, they have all of this done. Um, and they can do more in some cases. So um, this is, uh, for us, a very critical component. We believe that the more steps they can participate in, the more involvement they have in this whole process. Step seven, I've mentioned this. This is our... Um, customized tracking checklist, uh, and I encourage you, whether, and in the case with all of these, um, whether you purchase our manuals or you create your own or you go in some other direction, it's my goal for each of you to understand these steps that we have found after 35 years of doing this work. Um, and this tracking is so critical. Create your own checklist. Go and buy some other checklist, but however you do it, track their progress. Um, it, there is good research that shows that when that tracking is done, clients will get better faster. Um, and then the, the eighth step, uh, as I mentioned, the biopsychosociotheological cognitive behavioral framework, 
or the basics. And if you don't have a brain to work with that had some healthy nutrition and the right amount of sleep and exercise and other things, you are not going to make progress as quickly, if at all, with your client. So uh, very, very critical to the success that we've experienced is uh, doing this. And as I said, we do this not only for neurofeedback, but we do this for psychotherapy as well. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So there we are. There is the overview of what the last 35 years of my life have been about, or at least parts of it. Um, and now we will, with that context, here we go to um, the piece that we will be looking at more or most specifically over these next three times together, uh, functions, pathways, and EEG frequencies at each of the international 1020 system placements. And... <clears throat> Down here, um, now let me, before I go on and, and get into the specifics, any question about the overview? Does that make sense to you? Does it uh, seem like a good plan? Um, anything that you have to uh, add, subtract, challenge? No? Okay. So the question there is, when I was in ninth grade Spanish, and we came to the end of the year, and there was um, a week left before the final, and the Spanish uh, teacher uh, said, now we have a whole week, do you have any questions? Nobody put their hands up. And the teacher said, um, now that means one of two things you all either know so little you don't know enough how to ask a question or you know so much uh, that you don't need to. Well, I knew which class I fit in on that one. Uh, it was the one about not knowing enough to ask the question. Um, but I'm going to assume all of you are so smart that uh, you picked it all up uh, and we're good. Now, um, perspectives of the brain. Um, this is important for you to understand. It was important for me to understand. And, and let, me, uh, let me tell you one um, uh, other story uh, from my life now in the, in the brainwave world. Um, you will not find a person who is much more up than I am, happy, excited with life. And yet, even with that being the case, uh, when I started learning about neurophysiology, and I had never had a course on this, so now I'm here at conventions um, and conferences and workshops, and I'm learning about neurophysiology. And I would go in, I would, and, 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 and let me say, let me go back one step. Uh, for those of you who know Joel Kubar and Barry Sturman, uh, uh, how many people know those names? Yeah. Okay, we got, okay, okay, all right, good. So, Joel and Barry, I know that Joel and Barry came out of the womb knowing neuroanatomy and neurophysiology. <laughs> I just realized that, you know, early on that uh, that is how it was for them. Well, I did not come out of the womb that way. And so here I am getting into this field. I'm a psychologist, and I get into this field of brainwave training um, and based on neurophysiology. And each class in the beginning that I would come out of I would say to myself, Tom, you are the stupidest person on the face of the earth. There is no <laughs> way you are ever going to understand this. There is no hope for you, and you might as well just give up right now. And then I would be depressed for the rest of the day. 
Um, and this was an experience I came to recognize that I was going to go through again and again and again and again. Um, but in that true Marine Corps fashion of taking the hill, um, I kept smashing my head against the brick wall of neurophysiology until the wall finally gave. Um, <laughs> and uh, as much as Joel and Barry are always going to know more than I do, I do believe that I provide something that they don't provide, and that is I still know what it's like not to know. Um, and I think that puts me in a better place uh, to be able to teach to a lot of people. Um, so here is one of the pieces that came from uh, that, that painful uh, movement through this field. Um, I didn't know these perspectives. I didn't know uh, what a coronal view was or a sagittal view was. So now there's somebody teaching. They use this term. I'm there now stuck with how stupid I am because I don't know what they're talking about. And by the time I get over feeling bad about myself, or at least get over it to some degree, they've moved on to three other topics. Um, so I don't want any of you to be in the places uh, that, that I've been in if, uh, to whatever degree I can help. Um, so what we're going to do, um, and you all have manual one, so you all have this perspective. Um, let me just take you to the pictures of this. Um, so horizontal view, splitting the top from the bottom kind of looking up from the bottom or down from the top. Um, the ones, the, the, this coronal and sagittal are ones that the terms you will hear over and over again. And so now electronically we split the front of the head from the back of the head and it is though you are looking in from the back or from the front. I always think of looking in from the back. Um, and uh, it will give you that perspective. This is particularly good in looking at things like the cingulate gyrus, which we're going to talk about, uh, but for other things as well. And then sagittal splitting left from right electronically, and this would be called a mid-sagittal uh, perspective. And so you take one of the hemispheres away and you look in at the inside of the other hemisphere. Now, here we have the noraxis, so the brain and the spinal cord. Um, and in our shark here, and let me blow him up, um, the noraxis runs right from the, the front to the back, so that's nice and neat. And in the front, you have the anterior or rostral, which means beak. And in the back, you have a posterior or caudal, which means tail. The top, you have the dorsal. I always think of the dorsal fin on a fish. That helps me remember that. And ventral is the underside. Now, to our person, though, we have a little um, complexity here. This noraxis makes a 90-degree turn. Goes through our head and then down through the spinal cord. We still have our anterior or rostral and caudal or posterior in the, the front and the back and dorsal and ventral top and bottom. Now here we have the medial surface, the one in between if you split the brain, the lateral surface. Moving on. Here we have now our boy sitting and you see dorsal and ventral, but you have another dorsal and ventral when you go and look at the spinal cord point of view. Okay, and the caudal down here uh, for the spinal cord. Moving on. Um, uh, let me ask, any questions about those perspectives? No. But he's good with that? Good. No. Now, uh, here is um, Gary has been uh, pushing me to turn the manuals into books, and we are in the process of doing that, uh, much slower than Gary would like, um, but we're in that process, and uh, he brings stuff up to me and says, Tom, what is the black? What do these black numbers mean? What do the red numbers mean? 
And so now in the book version, uh, and actually updates to the manual version as well, um, we have written uh, black is the, the color of all the 1020 system placements. Um, and then the ones that are we are looking at for any particular page, um, those will be red. So in this case, we are looking at the left hemisphere of the cerebral cortex. So hence the left-hand side is in red. Um, and here we have a lateral view looking in from the side of the left hemisphere. Here a ventral view looking up from the bottom. Um, and then down in the lower right-hand corner, a mid-sagittal view where here's the left hemisphere with the right hemisphere having been removed electronically. Moving on. Um, Right hemisphere, same arrangement as the left um, on the opposite side. Anterior, so here's our frontal lobe, is the only lobe that is in the anterior. <coughs> and our lateral and ventral and mid-sagittal view. <coughs> Um, okay, I always struggle with doing the neuroanatomy because I always want to get to teaching you about neurophysiology. That's the excitement to me. Um, but I want to make sure you know where everything is. Um, somatosensory. So here is our somatosensory, and always we're looking at 1020, so C3, C, Z, C4. <clears throat> here is the motor portion of the somatosensory, and here is the perceptual um, portion in the back, part of the parietal lobe. Um, and next, now posterior. And now we have our looking here and this bluish purple. This is the parietal lobe. And here we have the temporal lobe. And here is our occipital lobe in the green. OK. And if you need me to slow down at all, you let me know. Just moving through these quickly. Now the frontal lobe has a number of parts to it. Here is prefrontal, primarily FP1, FP2. Oh, and let me say this to you. Uh, we use what we call an enhanced uh, international 1020 system. We have added FPZ and OZ. Uh, you cannot train uh, from a live Z-score point of view because the, the live Z-scores don't exist for this. But we train so often at FPZ and OZ through the years that we have added it so that we can mark it as a, a placement for training um, with our clients. Now, so FP1, FP2, and almost around F7 and F8 for the prefrontal. Um, ventral view and our mid-sagittal view. And now the dorsolateral, and dorsolateral is actually part of the prefrontal. In our newest updates, we now call this the dorsolateral prefrontal. Um, and this goes, uh, you can see we have it marked at F7, F8. We have now added to that F3 and F4. And um, they're part of the premotor, but they're also part of this dorsolateral, so we have them involved in both now. Um, here it is on the left and over on the right. And now, here's the premotor. motor 
f3, fz, f4, and the, the premotor comes all the way down um, to uh, close to the f8 and on both sides. So it doesn't just stop at f3, f4. It stretches pretty much uh, close to the full distance across left and right. And here's the picture of it. Uh, motor cortex, we already looked at the uh, uh, sensory motor. Here's just the motor component of it. And we think of this as the front part of the central. But again, it extends almost to T3 and T4. And now we go to the posterior portion. Um, and we have our temporal lobe at T3 and T5 on the left. And uh, next you'll see a T4 and T6 on the right. Okay. And parietal comes all the way back to a midline between the occipital and the parietal. Occipital in the back. And we have, anybody have any idea how many neurons we have in the brain? <clears throat> no, now, oh, let me say something to you. I should have said. <clears throat> um, I love teaching workshops. And about four years ago now, I thought, okay, let me see about in between the workshops trying to do some webinars. I did my first webinar, absolutely hated it, and just stopped doing it. And the reason that I hated it so much was because, and this is the way most webinars are taught, <clears throat> The person sits and they just talk. And that does not work for me. I need to have the live interaction. I need to see all of your smiling faces. Uh, that tells me whether what I'm saying is, is connecting or not connecting. And I want each of you, each of you have the option of seeing everybody else's faces. Um, so, when I heard about GoToMeeting um, and the, the potential, I mean, I've used it. Uh, we do long-distance neurofeedback training with GoToMeeting. Um, but I then thought one day, you know, I could try this webinar thing again. And um, uh, with the interaction, um, with seeing you and you seeing me and you seeing each other and you can hear each other, uh, this has now made it not as glorious as a workshop, but uh, it has made the whole thing alive. And it is our goal to uh, do a number of webinars. There are probably going to be about 24 different segments to all the webinars. That's the plan right now, <clears throat> which will cover our whole eight steps of the Beeman system. And... Um, it is my goal to make this a more alive experience all the time. And one of the things that we bring over from our workshops and that Gary is involved with um, <clears throat> is uh, that as you answer questions, as you invest yourself in this webinar process, you can earn prizes. So um, now my wife usually takes this whole box of prizes around when somebody gets an answer right at the workshop. Um, very exciting things like pens um, and uh, tablets and uh, so forth. But we find that it keeps the more energy in the room. 
So uh, Gary has come up with his kinds of prizes, and uh, um, I will be, as you answer questions, as you uh, invest yourself uh, and ask good questions and so forth, you are online for these major exciting prizes, and I don't want any of you to miss out on this opportunity. <laughs> so be involved. Um, be involved. Example of what it is. Go ahead, Gary. They are usually Amazon gift cards. Ooh. And a voice from this. So uh, they're very usable, very, very fun. So there you go. Now, so there are a hundred million neurons, excuse me, a hundred billion neurons. Um, our little gray matter that turn on and off, on and off, on and off, and create electricity, and that is what we are training, uh, these neurons. Those neurons are connected by our fasciculi, um, and we have a hundred trillion connections. So all the neurons talk to lots of their friends. So from a hundred billion to a hundred million connections. Um, this is what was called white matter. Myelination is white. And this lets everything talk to everything else. And when we begin the pathways process, um, the pathways, um, what we talk about is the, this part of the brain does a job, and then via the fasciculi, that is a little phrase that will become part of your brain, um, because everything is via the fasciculi, the information moves from one part of the brain to another part, to another part, to another part. And the fasciculi are everywhere. Uh, there are long-distance fasciculi and short-distance fasciculi, um, and uh, so we will not spend a lot of time on which type, but we will be talking about them over and over again. Now, <clears throat> deeper structures, and whereas the surface structures have been fairly simple to see and understand, the deeper structure is a little more complicated, and uh, whereas the surface structures from a 1020 point of view were all in red, now your deeper structures are all in green. Um, so for the thalamus, which is what we're looking at right now, here's our CZ. The thalamus is under CZ. Um, here's a view of it. Here's a coronal view. And right here in the center of the brain is our thalamus with its many parts, uh, many nuclei in the thalamus. And here's another view of it. Um, here are the reddish pinkish, whatever color that is, portion of the thalamus, and this is nested between the two parts of the basal ganglia. And underneath the thalamus is the hypothalamus. And now, here we have the basal ganglia. Uh, this is, uh, again, a little more challenging to, to grasp, but uh, it's just think of it on the two sides of the thalamus, <coughs> and there are uh, three major parts to the basal ganglia. I'm going to get to them in just a minute, but right here I want you to look. Uh, well, now let me actually uh, go to the next. Um, I'm going to show you this in just a couple minutes. I have, I have one question yes, if I could interject. Please, Anne. Um, are there direct correlations like with metabolic issues and training CZ right over the thalamus? Um, when you train CZ, number one, you can't train the thalamus directly. Right. Okay? Um, but it's my position that so much of the training in the early days was done just at CZ. Um, and 
Uh, CZ is on top of a number of structures, the thalamus again being uh, deeper underneath. Right. Um, and so it's my sense training at CZ, there are implications, although you can't train the thalamus directly, um, I think that when you train other parts of the brain, they talk to each other, and there are ways in which one part affects another part affects another part. And uh, when I get to, uh, and it won't be in this webinar, but if you come back and take the one on neuropathology, I can go into more depth in answering uh, your question about that. Okay. Okay? All right. <clears throat> now, the primary fasciculi is the corpus callosum. This is the biggest one. Here is our mid-sagittal point of view of the corpus callosum right here. Let me blow that up right here. Uh, corpus callosum, of course, connects the left and the right hemisphere, so everything's green on the left and the right. Um, and uh, not the occipital. And yet, I've just heard recently someone say there's research now, the new research that is showing that O1 and O2 are connected via the corpus callosum. <clears throat> so we'll wait until we get some more verification of that before we change our manual. But uh, that's part of our position. We think of our manuals as living manuals. That's the way we've talked about them for years. Uh, because as we update them, uh, and that's one of Gary's major jobs, to stay on top of the updating process. Uh, I do the work, but uh, he gets it out to people. And um, so he's making new and more exciting ways to get the information out as soon as uh, I update something. Um, so this, if the information comes through that O1 and O2 are connected, then that will be in the next round of updates. Here's the corpus callosum, a view of it. Uh, here we have it hooking up left side and right side, homologous pairs, but more than just homologous pairs. Now, here is the cingulate, part of the limbic system. Here, again, is our corpus callosum that we just looked at, but right above it, uh, and this is um, a coronal view. The back half of the head is cut off. We're looking like in from the back. And right in the center up here towards the top, not all the way up to the cortex, uh, but under the cortex is our corpus callosum. And that is an important piece to hold on to uh, for upcoming stuff that we're going to talk about. Here's our limbic system look that in some more detail there's that cingulate again which is part of it here's the green here's our cingulate coming down the midline here is our hypothalamus under T3 and T5 and T4 and T6 our amygdala is under T3 and T4 again deeper structures and here's another view of them, um, especially the hippocampus, amygdala, and one other part that I haven't mentioned yet called the septal nucleus, which we will talk about. And that is under, um, pretty much under FZ. I can't train it directly, but it has to do with... Um, the whole process of how information moves through the brain. Another view of the cingulate, blow up of it, we just spoke of that. The amygdala that I just mentioned under T3 and T4. And our hippocampus. And the septal again. Just bigger version here. Okay. 
<clears throat> now, something, um, when I teach, I always say to the people uh, that are attending the class, there's stuff that I'm looking for. And if you can find any of this stuff that I can't find yet, um, make sure you send it to me. I'm sure Gary will get you uh, another certificate uh, if you get it for me. And the um, septal nuclei, and the primary septal nuclei is called the nucleus accumbens. That septal nuclei or nucleus accumbens is connected to the prefrontal cortex. And it's connected via what is called the medial forebrain bundle. And I want you to have that in your head. I want that those three words to like, you know, um, when I taught my children their Bible and I would uh, teach Sunday school classes and <clears throat> I would tell people, the kids that I taught, uh, that the three um, uh, patriarchs of the, the Jewish uh, faith were Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I would say, now I want those three names to just r run off your tongue. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, in the same way, we're going to have some of those here in neuroanatomy. And one of them is medial forebrain bundle. So uh, I want you to get that down. And this connects, again, our septal nucleus or our nucleus accumbens up to the prefrontal cortex, the medial forebrain bundle. And someone I mentioned about asking people to send stuff to me, um, I couldn't find this and somebody um, sent it to me one day and said, Tom, you said you were looking for a medial forebrain bundle view. And uh, so, uh, yeah, make sure, uh, keep your eyes open for all these good things. Moving on. Um, now, I'm going to show you this. Let me come down here a little bit, get you a bigger view. Here we are, and we'll blow that up yet. Here is our basal ganglia, and the basal ganglia is made up of uh, three major parts. Uh, once again, you can't train this directly, but this is so important for understanding pathways. The caudate, the putamen, and the globus pallidus. So there are three more words I want you to have just roll off your tongue. Caudate, putamen, globus pallidus. And this is, again, a coronal view. It's as though we are looking in from the front. And here is the head of the caudate, and it is underneath F3, or the other side under F4. The body of the caudate, and this picture, you know, you can only show three dimensions in uh, a two-dimensional picture uh, so well. Um, the body of the caudate is under C3 and P3 on the left, and C4 and P4 on the right. And then the tail of the caudate comes all the way around and is under T3, temple 3 on the left, and temple 4 over on the right. Um, that makes sense? Those placements all work for everybody? Mm -hmm. All good? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the putamen, in this view, you can see the putamen is more medial toward the center from the caudate. There are other views that show it to be a little more lateral. So uh, maybe it's both lateral and medial. Maybe it's a fatter structure. Um, I have never spent the time to check on that. Um, but you see both perspectives, that it's both medial and lateral to the caudate. And then the globus pallidus, now more medial again, more toward the, the midline. Um, and information, um, 
Uh, well, I'll get to how inflammation moves later on. You hear a little noise in the background. They are cutting some branches off outside of where I am. Um, so that's just them putting the ladders up and down. Okay. Now, I want to take you to one other piece here. Here we are to our thalamus again inside the uh, basal ganglia. And here is our hypothalamus. And you all hear thalamus and hypothalamus. But what most of you probably have not heard, I certainly had not, is this portion called the subthalamus. So here, they're both below the thalamus, hence the word hypo, under, and sub, under, both under the thalamus, um, but the hypothalamus is, again, more medial, and the subthalamus is, is lateral to that hypothalamus. And this subthalamus has a lot to do with uh, a neuropathology that um, if you take the neuropathology webinar, I will get into that, but I want to introduce you to it right here. Is that a recent finding? I haven't heard of that either. Um, I, I couldn't tell you, Blair. Um, I, um, I know it's, it's recent. Well, not recent. I mean, I came across it about 10 years ago, so it's not, not that recent. But I'm guessing it's been around, and um, in my ignorance, I just had not come across it. Um, so, <laughs> Maybe there's not a lot of research on it yet. <laughs> probably not. But there's enough that I'm going to tell you something thrilling about it when it comes to neuropathologies. All right. So that's that. There's just another view. Uh, here, we can't do anything with training um, with the brain stem. But because it sends information from the cortex down into the viscera, into the organs of the body, um, and that has a lot of implications for our work. Uh, that's why I put it in here. All right. There's our 1020 head. And uh, this was for part of our uh, four-day workshop. Uh, this was time to go and have something to eat. You guys don't get to do that. Um, but uh, that's where that came from. All right. That said, we will leave here. And let me get out of this. Um, so don't save. Do you want to save the changes you made? I wasn't aware of making any. No. <laughs> okay. Now, get rid of that. Get rid of that. And we will move on to our PowerPoint. Open this up. All right. Now we move to our physiology. Now we get to what I enjoy, the functions. And so our fasciculi, I've already mentioned this, um, high-speed myelinated white matter which connects one part of the cerebral cortex to another. The corpus callosum connects the left and right hemispheres, just as an example of a major corpus callosum, of a major fasciculi. Um, and Are there fasciculi in the gray matter or only the white matter? 
one second here. I want to lost your faces. There we are. Um, I'm sorry, ask again. Are there fasciculi in the gray matter also, or is that only white matter? Only white matter. So the gray matter are our neurons, right. and the white matter are the fasciculi, the connections of neuron to neuron. So you said that the primary connector is the corpus callosum. A primary in the sense of how big it is. Right. If that's not intact, then the brain, I'm assuming, has other ways to connect? Well, if you have, I mean, some of the things they have done, um, for instance, when people would have seizure disorders, uh, one of the things they would do would be to cut the corpus callosum so the left hemisphere could not talk to the right hemisphere. And this helped to reduce the seizures in some cases. Um, now, you, you hear with people that have had that done, and there's also a number of other stories that, for instance, if the, the one hemisphere is damaged, you have the other hemisphere start to compensate to some degree. Um, so if there's damage to the corpus callosum or any fasciculi, uh, I believe that it, the brain will look for other pathways, again, to whatever degree it can do that. And part of our training, uh, when you do coherence training, what you are doing, to, again, to one degree or another, is you are encouraging the brain to have the uh, information movement from neuron to neuron to look for different paths or to strengthen existing paths. Um, so the coherence when you do magnitude training, I think that you are training primarily the um, neurons that are underneath where you're training. When you do coherence training, you are looking for uh, a similarity between what the roll wave, for instance, and the timing of that roll wave of one placement is compared to another placement. And that timing, the, the looking, if you look at the roll wave, if everything is lined up perfectly, or in the term in phase, the timing of it's perfect, um, then that has much implication for coherence or other things that have implications for coherence training. And you can have those two placements be too similar, which is hypercoherent, or too dissimilar, which is hypocoherent. I don't did I answer your question well enough, Zoe? I think so. Okay. I'm curious what that looks like. You know, I don't know your stance on um, bipolar versus monopolar training and how that works for people maybe who don't have the connection with the corpus callosum with the right and left. Yeah, and um, I can't go into that a lot right now. Again, that would be under the, the training portion of, um, of the webinar series. But I, I would just say that, uh, first of all, all training it, to one degree or another is bipolar. Um, all training has a differential amplifier that lets you look at one placement compared to another. Now, the one is typically the linked ears. And ideally, you don't have any activity in the linked ears, but that is not the case. The linked ears can become corrupted with activity from T5 or T6, um, and that impacts on um, when you look at a brain map, for instance. Um, but to do what is traditionally called bipolar training, um, that's going to impact, I mean, even when you do uh, not just bipolar, but when you do multi-placement training, you can still use a linked ear reference, but do more than one placement training. And when you do that, you can look at coherence. Uh, we do that all the time. The live Z-scores let us watch the coherence of multi-placement training, whether um, you know, it's, it's still reference to the linked ears. 
um, but it has some of the, the same impact that your, your bipolar training would have. Uh, there's other implications that I, I can't go into now, but um, so yeah, but that's the coherence uh, lets you watch how much or little are each placement that you're training talking to each other whenever you're doing two or more placement training. Okay, so there is our fasciculi and this particular one, the corpus callosum. And next, our thalamus. And here are the blow-ups of it. Thalamus here in the center. We're just looking at the left half here and here the right half. Uh, and the thalamus connects the sensory organs to areas of primary sensory processing. So this is a primary function of the thalamus. And we will be looking at this and going over this again and again and again as we work through the pathways. Um, eyes are connected to the primary visual cortex of the occipital lobe. Ears are connected to the primary auditory cortex of the uh, temporal lobe. Um, body sensations and positions are connected to the primary somatosensory cortex of the parietal lobe. Um, and then we have, it connects the cerebellum to the motor strip, sets overall tone or level of excitation to the entire cerebral cortex, um, and also transfers information from the basal ganglia to the motor cortex. And that's done via the thalamus. Okay? Now, moving on. And our left hemisphere. Left hemisphere. Um, and the way I like to think of this uh, first is the left hemisphere thinks in terms of dots or of, of pieces, small pieces of information. And if you put enough dots together, what do you get? Communication? Well, it's true, but I'm thinking that like, come at it more from a mathematical point of view. You put enough dots together, what do you get? A line. Okay, Jeff comes with that first answer, Gary. Get him down there for that prize. Um, so the left hemisphere does things linearly. Okay. Um, now, uh, if you think from a linear point of view, in time, you have sequential thinking. So linear, sequential, piece by piece. Um, here under A, I have to analyze it. The, the word analyze comes from the Greek word analuo, and luo has to, to do with destroy or take apart. So it sees the individual tree. If it's looking at a forest, it sees a, the tree. Sees one book out of place in the library, understanding the flaw in the plot. It takes things apart and understands them. Thinking sequentially, one word after another, one note of a song after another learning the individual components of a new task. Uh, linguistically, you know, the left hemisphere lets you perceive, comprehend, uh, store memory from a linguistic point of view, from a language point of view, and also lets you formulate and express um, linguistic information. So the left hemisphere has to do with language input 
and language outgo. Okay? It has to do with both receptive and expressive language. And then it has you think logically. All right? Now, critical for you, it's critical for you to get everything. I'm going to say that all over the place. Uh, but I want you to get these big pieces, especially, that to understand what the left hemisphere does and the right hemisphere and the frontal lobe and the posterior lobe, um, those four things will be constantly brought up. So uh, get this left hemisphere down, this points, little pieces, linear, and the primary, for our society, the primary linear process is linguistic, is language. That's why people come to us for training. They come because their children are having trouble in school. Not the only reason, but that is certainly one of the major ones. Moving on. Now we will go to right hemisphere. And now, whereas on the left side, we analyzed, we took things apart, the right hemisphere synthesizes. It puts things together. Now, whereas the left hemisphere saw the tree, the right hemisphere sees the whole forest. Whereas the left hemisphere thought in that um, fashion of one thing at a time happening, the right hemisphere comprehends, and just as an example, how all the parts of the engine work together simultaneously. The right hemisphere can grasp the concept of the camshaft going around, the crankshaft going around, the pistons going up and down, um, the rods moving up and down, etc., etc. So it lets you see everything at one time. Uh, saying that in another way, instead of thinking linearly, it thinks spatially or holistically. It lets you do things like putting puzzles together or three-dimensional chess. And whereas the left hemisphere lets you hear note after note after note in a, a timing sequence, the right hemisphere lets you hear a chord, which are a number of notes at the same time. This is to me why I think music is so powerful, because music draws from the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere at the same time. Uh, the right hemisphere, whereas uh, on the left, you can read the words in a book. On the right, you can read something else, but it's not letter after letter and word after word. You can read faces. A face is a space. Spatial things are the domain of the right hemisphere, and faces, from a social point of view, are one of the most important spaces to be able to read. Okay? Um, you can read the faces. You can create facial expressions based on the right hemisphere. And then when it comes to the left, you can listen to words and sentences. On the right, you comprehend the way those words were said. Intonation and prosody and pitch and cadence, all of those are right hemisphere functions. So you can both comprehend and you can create those vocal tones, the intonation, 
because that communicates a lot to the person that you're interacting with or they are communicating a lot to you through that. And we have had a number of kids through the years that have been brought to us because they have trouble socially. And what we know uh, is, is one of the common reasons from a neurofeedback point of view is to look in the right side of the brain, the right posterior usually, can they hear the changes in pitch and intonation and cadence? Can they see the changes on the person's face? And if there's trouble, if they have abnormal readings in that right posterior, then um, they're not going to be able to do this as well. And that will negatively affect them socially. And then, whereas the left hemisphere had to do with logic, the right hemisphere has more to do with emotion, and especially what we call the negative emotions. I don't actually like that word, negative, but um, this is where the emotions of anger, rage, fear, and sadness live over on the right hemisphere. Any questions about left and right? Okay, everybody's good? Mm -hmm. That means you're all ready to be able to teach this course for me when it comes to left and right hemisphere. All right, excellent. Okay, moving on. Thank you. <clears throat> Now, let me show you, when I uh, <clears throat> was a child, uh, I got this visible V8 for Christmas one year, and this was a great highlight of mine that I was able to understand how it worked, uh, the, the camshaft and crankshaft and pistons. And it's plastic, so you can see right through it. You can see all these parts moving at the same time. Uh, this is a right hemisphere function. Mm -hmm. um, and let me just make another quick point to that. Boys frequently, not always, but frequently, do not do as well as little girls when it comes to language in the earlier grades. Uh, little girls have more connections between left and right hemisphere than little boys do. Uh, and that has a number of implications. But what will happen, you can have bright little boys that get turned off to school um, because of the struggle with language. And what they do then is they go into wood shop or metal shop or um, and I have seen a number of these people through the years that have gone in uh, to those types of fields. And now they're in their 20s or 30s or 40s. And you can just see how incredibly bright they are and how good they have become with language. Um, but because they weren't pushed in those lower grades and they were so turned off that um, they just went away from the uh, educational world. Uh, and I understand that because, uh, in one sense, I was one of those little boys. Um, begged my father to let me quit in 10th grade and to go, because I was good at putting my 56 Ford engine together. Um, so I'm glad now that he didn't have let me do that, but uh, uh, I understand that the struggles with language in younger years. There's some new research out um, in the education field talking about a paradigm shift in school and starting boys into kindergarten and first grade a year or two later than they normally would so that their brain has time to mature a little bit more so as to hopefully avoid some of these issues. Wow, I had not but heard. That would be, of course, a huge paradigm shift for the educational field. And it surely would, and, and also the implications socially. Right. Uh, yeah. But it may, may well work better because little boys are so impulsive and immature often. And mm -hmm. them being a couple years older, they probably match up with the little girls better. Right. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Interesting. Mm 
Very interesting. Yeah, and interestingly, there's some new games out for little girls. Um, I actually got it from my aunt for mine um, that a female engineer developed for visual spatial skills for little girls because typically that's not as strong for little girls. And so creating some board games, things like that, where they can actually work on those skills as opposed to their language skills. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Um, moving along. Now, here we are going to posterior. And now, major job, the posterior, is the processing of the primary sensory input from the external world, especially for visual, auditory, and somatosensory. The transforming of the processed primary sensory input into perception. The matching of these perceptions, which is done cortically, with memory, hippocampal and amygdaloid, which are deeper structures. The comprehending and understanding cortically of the memory match, which was hippocampal and amygdaloid, uh, which are deeper structures. So the posterior part of the brain does many jobs, but these are some of the major ones. Primary sensory um, processing, perceptual um, processing of that primary sensory input, the matching of these perceptions with memory, both a factual and emotional memory, and then the comprehending uh, of what that memory match is. Moving on. Now we're going to the anterior cortex, so the frontal lobe. Self-awareness. Executive function. This is big for us in the neurofeedback world. Planning, organizing, decision-making, problem-solving, attending. All of those executive functions. Emotional processing. Motor control, personality, and inhibition, huge for the frontal lobe. Here's a little model we've created. Uh, here is the prefrontal, which we'll talk about more. Um, but this is the brain as a business. Here's our prefrontal, and I think of that as the chief executive officer. It does this planning and organizing and so forth. Then it sends that information back to middle management, which is called the premotor. This was confusing to me. We have the prefrontal and then the premotor. And then once middle management um, has received the information from the CEO, from the prefrontal, it sends it back to the workers. Okay, and that's the motor strip. You can see it down here. Here's our CEO in the prefrontal. Here's our premotor for middle management. And here are our workers. And workers meaning that's what makes my mouth move or your hands move. Um, the motor strip controls all of that motor activity. Moving along, the sensory motor strip. Um, and uh, let me just say to you, for years, sharing my ignorance of this whole field when I began, um, I knew that there was a frontal lobe. We have all these Fs here from a 1020 system point of view. And I knew there's a parietal lobe, and an occipital lobe, and a temporal lobe, and these all have these letters. So therefore, it only made sense to me that if there are C's, there must be a central lobe. And it wasn't until some years later I realized there is no central lobe. So the frontal lobe butts up against the parietal lobe, 
and they just use the C's as a nomenclature to be able to discuss it. So the front part of the C's is where the motor strip lives, and the back part of the C's is where the primary somatosensory um, part of the brain lives. Okay. Now, moving on. Are we going to be pausing at 9.30? Uh, say it again, Beth. Are, are we going to be pausing at 9.30? Uh, now, it is 11.22 my time. So you're two hours uh, behind us. We are going to stop at 11.45 our time, which would make it 9.45 your time. Thank okay. you. Yes. Okay. So the sensory motor strip, the coordination of somatosensory input with motor outflow, the constant coordinated interaction between the somatosensory cortex and the motor cortex. The, the majority of the fasciculi that come out of this primary somatosensory part of the brain go to the motor and the motor back to it, constantly talking to each other in order for that motor strip. In order for you to move your right hand, you must know where it is. Your brain has to know where it is before it is able to make it go to somewhere else. All right. Now, here's the homunculus that you've all seen. Different jobs that are done along the motor strip. And um, from a 1020 system point of view, what 1020 system placement controls the right hand? C3. C3, who was that? Was that you, Blair? Yeah. Okay. Let's give Blair a prize for that. And hence, what part of the brain controls the left hand? C4. C4. Um, was that Blair again or was that Ann? Mm -hmm. was Blair. Blair. Okay. All right. Very good. Uh, and you can come down here and see here close to T3 and T4, we have the lips and the jaw and the tongue and swallowing, and that has implications for other things we'll look at uh, when we, um, in the, the course on neuropathologies, how this all fits together. Okay, now moving on. Now we're going to go to the occipital lobe, and here we have our primary visual cortex. In addition, we have the visual association cortex. So the primary cortex, more in the back here, has to do with primary visual processing. And the association cortex has to do with visual perception. You can see it's partly in the occipital lobe, partly in the parietal lobe. Um, okay. So the processing of the primary visual input from the external world and the transforming of the process primary visual input into a visual perception. And there are several types of perception that we talk about. One is the where of, uh, I said perception, uh, one is the where of vision. Um, and the other is the what of vision. So what we're looking at, where is it? Um, that's a visual process, and then what is it that we're looking at? So where and what, and we'll go into those in more detail. Now, moving on to the temporal lobe, our T3, T5, T4, T6, and here is our temporal lobe. 
Okay. And you can see up on the top here the auditory association cortex and down here on the bottom. So this is called the superior temporal and this is the inferior temporal. And that's where the visual, another visual association cortex lives. So you saw this visual association cortex for perception up here between the occipit and the parietal. And now you see another part of visual association cortex in the inferior portion of the temple. And again, stop me if you go. My manual is this. So I'll find I'm sorry, who's who's speaking to me? Oh, uh, that's it's Beverly. My manual. Oh, Beverly, oh your your head's cut off, Beverly. Yeah, it is. Oh, because I, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to be distracting to everybody. Uh, my manual isn't in this order, and it doesn't have a lot of this paperwork. Um, so oh. I'm having to jump all over trying to figure out where everything is. Okay, okay. Let me, um, let me. Uh, I will have Sarah get to you about that, Beverly. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, and there's some actually some updates that are coming, uh, and it is our plan to have them to you. Uh, these will get to go out to everybody, but uh, we um, will have them to you prior to the next uh, webinar. Now, here we have for our temporal lobe uh, the processing of the. Um, primary auditory input from the external world, the transformation of the process primary input into an auditory perception. That's what those association cortices do. Um, the transforming of the process primary visual input into a visual perception. And then also part of the matching of the auditory and visual perceptions, which are cortical, with memory, hippocampal, amygdaloid, which are deeper structures. And finally, the information after its memory matched comes back up to the surface, and we have the comprehending of the memory match from the deeper structures. So all of this is done in the temple lobe primary auditory, then the perceptions for both auditory and vision, then the part, half of the memory matching that goes on with the deeper structures of the hippocampus and amygdaloid, uh, or amygdala, and then it comes back up to the surface for comprehension. And we will go over this again and again as we go through pathways. Is that where it comes back in with the anterior cingulate? The anterior cingulate is going to be much further down the path. So we will take many steps before we get to the anterior cingulate. All right. Now, let's move along here. Now we have left temporal. And all the things that I just said to you about the temporal, you will now see again in left temporal, but now it will talk about the particular jobs of the left compared to the right. So now we are going to have primary verbal input. And we are going to have the perception of verbal um, and, and auditory in general, but particularly verbal. Um, and we are going to have that uh, visual perception, again, of verbal, and memory matching for reading and listening, and comprehension uh, for verbal. So the left hemisphere and other things other than verbal, but certainly verbal is a big piece of, again, who will come to you. Right hemisphere, uh, right, right temple, excuse me. And now we have nonverbal. Now we have sound voice. So again, that pitch and cadence and uh, prosody. 
and we have spatial over on the right part of the temple, being able to see those faces, um, and then the memory matching and the comprehension. Okay, moving along, parietal. And now with the parietal, um, we have that processing of the primary somatosensory touch um, from an inter external world point of view. There's also an internal world of the parietal, uh, but we'll be looking primarily at this time at the external world of touch from the skin. So the hand is what we use as an example. And then it takes that primary information and turns it into a somatosensory perception. Um, the parietal lobe also does perception for vision. Uh, it also has to do with integrating somatosensory and visual perception. Now, can anybody tell me in the sports world what we call this? That integration of somatosensory and visual perceptions. Million dollar contract? A million dollar contract, Gary just said. <laughs> peak performance. Well, there is, to do this well, it is of peak performance, but there's a name. All big points. Um, okay, this is eye hand coordination mm. okay eye foot eye other things but eye hand is what you hear so often um, and then whereas the temporal lobe had to do with comprehension the parietal lobe is also part of that comprehension memory matching and then comprehension all right moving along Occipital lobe, now what we're doing here, now we're going to start with pathways. And the processing of the primary visual input from the external world, we're just looking at A right now. Uh, the time will come in the future where we ghost out the other parts here. And here we've got our boy and girl looking at each other. And the first step is... Uh, oh, and let me give you a sort of a legend here. Um, the red, as I said, is surface. The green is deeper structures. Uh, and when there are these dots, dashes, I guess, that says we're on the way to that place. So the, the boy and girl see each other, their eyes process this, and it sends the information... <clears throat> via the fasciculi to the thalamus. It gets to the thalamus, and the thalamus determines to which primary cortex or cortices the sensory input will be sent. In this case, for vision, where is it going to go? The occipital. The occipital lobe. So now, and then the ghosting here means it's leaving somewhere. So it, we're leaving the thalamus, blow that up, and green for deeper structure, and now it's coming to red for surface. our surface in the occipital lobe, O1, OZ, and O2. Okay? And visual has a color. These all have colors, too. Visual is orange. So we got our thalamus deeper structure information transfer via the fasciculi from the thalamus to the primary visual cortex, which is surface of the occipital lobe. Now we go from there to the visual system then the processing of the primary visual input, and that happens right back here. So the information was being sent there from the thalamus, and now we're doing the primary visual processing. And what this means to me is that the brain is just saying, 
information is just came in. doesn't tell you much about it, but it's saying visual information just came in. Then we are going to shift here and back to our temporal lobe. Um, and the temporal lobe, uh, both left and right, we've gone through them for you. And now we're just going to look at here is this the processing of the primary verbal input from the external world that's left temporal and over on the right the processing of the primary nonverbal input the sound voice that cadence and prosody and pitch from the external world and here's our girl listening with her headset on and so it's going to go from her ears via the fasciculi into the thalamus and then once it gets to the thalamus, the thalamus processes it, uh, does it, does its decision making. Uh, one of the webinars I taught on this, the young man talked about it tasks it out. I got a kick out of that, tasks it out. Um, and so um, determines where is the sensory input going to be sent. And here it's going to leave the thalamus and go to the T3 and T4. And this is the anterior superior temporal lobe. I already showed you this is the superior part of the temporal lobe up here. And this is the front portion of it. So it's anterior superior on both sides. Um, so we take via the fasciculi, the thalamus sends the information to the primary auditory. And once it gets there, then the primary processing is done. And again, just as with vision here with auditory, we have that the brain knows something just happened. There's some auditory thing that just happened. Next, um, whoops, second here, my slides shifted. Now, we're going to the primary, um, the parietal anterior part of the parietal lobe, and the processing of the primary somatosensory input, which for our needs today will be touch. And here's our lady touching her prized flowers. And so we are going to go from the hand into the, another view of the temporal lobe, excuse me, of the thalamus. Um, when it gets to the thalamus, the thalamus determines to which primary cortex sensory input will be sent. And then here it is sent from there up to the surface, in this case, um, the anterior parietal lobe. So C3, CZ, C4 comes all the way around almost to T3 on the left and T4 over on the right. That's for primary somatosensory. And it gets there, and now the primary somatosensory input is processed. All right. That makes sense. Everybody good with that? Information moves from the sensory organ 
It goes to the thalamus. The thalamus decides where it's going to go. It goes to the primary parts of occipital lobe, temporal lobe, parietal lobe for these three senses, which are the three that people come to us for most. Uh, so they're the ones I have focused on. Uh, and I and really auditory and visual is the, the, the most of the most. Now, moving along. Now we're going to take this second step for the occipital lobe, and we have the transforming of the processed primary visual input into a visual perception. And in addition, in the parietal lobe, um, so we just looked at the occipital lobe. Now in the parietal lobe, we also have the transforming of the process primary visual input into a visual perception. So both the anterior, let me show you this one second. Ah, let me go up this way. Let me just use this head. So here's our parietal lobe comes back to right about in here, and that's where our occipital lobe begins. So both the anterior portion of the occipital lobe and the posterior portion of the parietal lobe, both of these do visual um, processing from an association or perception point of view. Um, in addition, in the temporal lobe, we have the transforming of the process primary visual input into a visual perception, the what of vision. So all three lobes do this secondary kind of processing which we then turns into a perception. So here's our boy and girl looking at each other again. And we come down. And by next time when we get together, I'm going to expect all of you to have how everything moves. Um, and I'm going to ask you, instead of me telling you, I want you to like be a, a, a chorus that just says all this, and that's the way you will learn it best. So it goes from the eyes to the thalamus. Thalamus decides where it's going to go next. It goes from there back to the occipital lobe for vision. Occipital lobe does the primary processing, and then it sends it out up here to the anterior occipital and the posterior parietal and to the inferior temporal, both sides. And information is then processed uh, in that secondary way. We call those association cortices, and they provide perceptions. So the transforming of the process primary visual input into a visual perception. And now, I want you to get this down very clearly. We've gone over it, but we'll go over it a bunch more times. Linear, sequential, detailed linguistic for left, and right hemisphere, holistic, global, spatial, pictorial. So you've got to keep them in mind. All right, moving on, and we're actually right on time for us to end, but I want to take you through um, about another three minutes worth. Um, now we're going to auditory, and now we have the transforming of the process primary auditory into an auditory perception. So she hears, goes from ears to thalamus, Thalamus decides where it's going to be sent, gets sent out there to the anterior superior temporal for primary 
auditory processing. And now the next step is it's going to come back to the superior part of the temple for auditory association processing, um, which turns the primary into a perception. And here it is, transforming the primary auditory into an auditory perception. Now here on the left, whether it's vision or auditory, it is linear, sequential, detailed, linguistic, same thing. But on the right, whereas for vision, you had spatial and holistic uh, words like that that are appropriate to vision. When it comes to auditory, now we go to um, intensity, pitch, cadence, amplitude, duration. So the kinds, the quality of that auditory input. Um, and then last but not least, We've got our parietal, um, and we are looking at parietal central now. We just looked at the anterior parietal before for the primary processing with the central parietal. Then we have the transforming of the process primary somatosensory input into a somatosensory perception. So Our Lady touches her flowers, information is sent to the thalamus, thalamus decides where it's going to go, it's sent up now to first of all our anterior parietal. The anterior parietal does the primary somatosensory processing Then it's sent back from the anterior parietal back toward the central parietal, and the central parietal is going to do the transforming of the primary into a somatosensory perception. Um, and left and right hemisphere, if you come across Somatosensory processes for the left and right hemisphere, by all means, get them to me, because I have not found that yet. Um, so I know it for visual and auditory, and they're the two primary ones that we use for our training. But um, we know that the left side affects the right side of the body and vice versa. But for other functions, I have not found that to be clear. But this is where it goes. So there you are. Um, that is going to end our first time um, and have pathways through the brain. Um, and I hope you'll study them. And Bev, please get in touch and we'll work that all out. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. And it's good to be with all of you. And um, I'll look forward to seeing you, I guess, in two weeks because of Thanksgiving being in between. Yes, we will reconvene on December 3rd which is a Tuesday at 9.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And so we're going to skip Thanksgiving week. So Tom and I wish you all a happy Thanksgiving, and we'll see you next time. This is Brownback Mason, Pathways Through the Brain, Webinar Part 1, ending the session and the recording for today. You all have a great day. Thank you. Thank happy Thanksgiving. You. Thank you. Thank you.